Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. Good morning and welcome once again to Clemens Moravian Church on this uh, 18th Sunday after Pentecost. If you're visiting with us for the first time, either virtually or here in person, we uh, especially want to welcome you and your presence among us. Here at Clemens Moravian Church, we believe that God is doing something very special with our church family and our friends. We are here, all of us, seeking God's face for even a more significant presence in our lives. So again, thanks for being here today. I do want to mention briefly that after uh, church today, immediately after church today, we're going to gather uh, at our picnic shelter and have a wonderful time uh, of fellowship. So you're welcome to come join us uh, for a picnic today. Also uh, today, we have a note on the pews uh, about our 365 stewardship program that we're getting ready to kick off. Uh, it's something that we have done for the last couple of years. Some of you see the little tags on your pews, but uh, that's just a reminder that we're going to be talking about that in the coming weeks. And I also wanted to say that um, we have just lots of things happening here in our church family. Look in your bulletin, you see that it's just kind of chocked full with all the activities. So Look through those, and if you see something you want to participate in or be involved in, just let us know at the church office, and we will put you in touch with the right people. Finally, today, lastly, uh, today, uh, during our service, we honor one of our sisters who is now in the more immediate presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Sister Linda Massengill, with a candle and a song that we will sing uh, later in our service. Again, welcome to Clemens Moravian Church on this day, will you pray with me? Father, we come to you on this morning as we have gathered for worship to ask that you would keep our footsteps firm on solid ground, helping us to be consistent and faithful. Give us supernatural endurance to stay the course, not swerving to the right or to the left, or being too easily distracted by other things that would seek to call us away from a close walk with you. Lord, we ask that you shine your light in us, through us, and over us. May we make a difference in this world for your glory so that your purposes would stand. Set your way before us. May all your plans succeed. May we reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence and healing. And, Lord, asking these prayers, we praise you and we bless you and we thank you we thank you for your love of us and your care and your concern. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today, both in the southern province of the Moravian Church and the northern province of the Moravian Church, we celebrate and pray for our missionaries. So our liturgy today is World Mission. It's found in your blue hymn book on page 65. And if you are able, I'm going to ask that you stand as we pray this prayer together this morning. All your creatures, Lord, will praise you, and all your people will give you thanks. They will speak of the glory of your Lord and tell Everyone will know your mighty deeds and the glorious majesty of your kingdom. Your rule is eternal, and you are king forever. You, Lord, are righteous in all you do, merciful in all your acts.
With sincere hearts and open minds, let us now acknowledge the sin that entangles us and prevents us from doing God's will. Compassionate Lord, call us to a higher standard than we have achieved. We therefore bow in honest now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus hear the word of our Lord I do not condemn you go but do not sin again God created the heavens and stretched them out fashioned the earth and all that lives there and gave life and breath to all its people God chose no partiality to race or culture. All who have reverence for him and do what is right are acceptable to God. Let us praise God for his glorious grace for the free gift he gave us in his dear son. This is the good news. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, all people may participate in God's blessing. There is no longer rich or poor black or white, male or female, for we all one in union with Christ Jesus.
may be seated. Let us pray for our missionaries, light and desire of all nations. Watch over your messengers by land, sea, and air. I looked, and there was a great multitude. No one could count all the people. They were from every race, tribe, nation, and language, and they stood in front of the throne and of the Lamb, holding palm branches in their hands. They called out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God, who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. It's now time for our stewardship and our morning offering, so I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward, please.
It's such a, a powerful feeling to know that we are loved and loved by you. We ask, Lord, that you bless these gifts, that you use them, multiply them for your work here in the kingdom and around. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture comes to us from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. Hear the word of God. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, a descendant of David, that is, that is my gospel for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This saying is sure. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before the Lord that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does, not, does no good, but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. If you are able, would you please stand for the reading of the gospel? Reading from Luke 17, beginning in verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with skin disease approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not the ten made clean? So where are the other nine? Did none of them return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Our memorial hymn today is When Peace Like a River, page 754. Please remain seated and uh, we will sing this hymn. Also, it's time for the children to go to Children's Church, so if you are going to be a part of Children's Church, you may head that direction now.
Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we do thank you that we have this opportunity to gather today as a church family in this time of worship, the opportunity of fellowship, to hear the songs of faith, to listen to the words, your words, of hope and salvation. And Lord, we ask that your spirit guide us and keep us in this moment, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Warren Wisby, in his commentary on the book of Colossians, tells a story about one night many years ago. Ed Spencer, who was a student in seminary near Lake Michigan in Chicago, was awakened by shouts that there had been a shipwreck offshore from the campus. An excursion boat, apparently, uh, from the nearby Chicago Harbor had collided with a, a freighter of sorts, and the freighter was sinking. Spencer ran down to the lake shore from which he could see lights from the boats. He was, even though a slight man, he was a very good swimmer, an experienced swimmer, a strong swimmer, and he plunged into the icy water and he started searching for survivors. For six hours, Spencer swam out and back, pulling people ashore, battling the stormy waves and the powerful undertow that defines Lake Michigan. By dawn, he had personally rescued 15 people in as many trips. Exhausted, he sat down until someone spotted two more still in the water, and Spencer drove, uh, dove in again and found a man and a woman clinging desperately to a piece of wreckage. He brought them in, too, and then he finally collapsed on the beach. Less than 100 of the 400 passengers on that boat survived the shipwreck. 17 of them were rescued by Ed Spencer. His own health, however, was irreparably damaged by this act of heroism. He was never able to return to work. He was never able to do the things that a normal person would do, could not go back to school. Ultimately, he lived his days out uh, as a physically compromised uh, person because of this experience. And, and the reason why I tell this story is years later, a reporter was doing a a lengthy article about the Great Lakes tragedies over the years, and he found Spencer as an old man in a nursing home in California, and he asked for his recollections of that night, and Spencer said penetratingly, the only thing I really remember is that not one of the 17 ever thanked me. Ingratitude. For some people, it is a way of life, and I would suggest a very ugly way of life. However, everyone who lives a life dedicated to others, and I would say dedicated to our Lord at some point in time or another, will experience ingratitude. The reality is we live in a time and a place where too many people are committed to the idea that they are entitled. Consequently, thankfulness seems a lost, nearly extinct art. Yet while culture has not helped us in this department, Jesus, I think, in this parable suggests in that there's something much deeper, there's a problem that goes much deeper, and it's rooted in our fallen hearts. As we see this familiar event that we talk about every year, usually this time of year, through the eyes of St. Luke, the situation seems apparent, at least on the surface. There are 10 people in need, and as they come to the Lord, they cry out in a singular voice, Scripture tells us, for mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. 
They are simply overwhelmed with their life condition. Luke goes on. He says, the Lord hears them. He hears them and their request and then gives them instructions to follow. They do. And after they follow the instructions, they are fully restored from their affliction. In fact, one of them is so stunned by the complete turnaround in his physical healing by what happened, so compelled by this new possibility and reality in his life, for we have to get behind the culture and the context to understand to have leprosy or some kind of skin disease made you unclean, and you could not participate in the normal activities of, of your spiritual group or your, 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 your families. You, you were kind of an outcast. And so this, this one man recognized that the healing in his life represented a whole new start, a whole new reality for what he had been through. So he must return to the Lord and express his profound gratitude for what has happened. The point seems obvious, or is it? You see, there, there, there appears to be two issues that Jesus confronted to them in analyzing what they had just seen taking place. What a person asks for is not always what a person really needs. Let me say that again. What we ask for is not always what we really need. Did the lepers even notice that they had cried out for what? Somebody say it. Wake up. Thank you. Mercy. Praise God. <laughs> don't, make, don't make me come down from here. <laughs> they cried out for mercy, but what did they receive? They were healed. Jesus knew what they needed before they knew what they needed. They just wanted some kind of respite, maybe a day of not being in that situation. But God, through his son, Jesus Christ, healed them. They cried for mercy, but in fact, they received healing. What a person asks for is not always what a person needs. And the Lord knows what his children needs are. When is the last time you prayed to God for something only to get what sounded like maybe a busy signal on the other side? No answer. I believe that for many of us, especially in what we interpret as the critical moments in our life, wh wherever they are, uh, whatever's happening, we often cry out for God for what we think we need, but we really don't evaluate or maybe think through what is best for us. And this can not only be challenging, especially when we feel like we're not getting an answer or a busy signal, but spiritually it can be dangerous. And I said that wrong. When we cry out for what we want instead of what we need. Think of, think of it this way, uh, what many folks call the terrible twos, which is very familiar in my life right now, um, as it relates to the development of children. Like a child who is not old enough or had the life experience to understand the difference between a want and a need, we too spiritually have the same challenge. That's what Jesus is essentially saying. And it is a wise parent, even though at times it can be really embarrassing and really hard to do, takes a lot of willpower not to give in to the want over the need. 
And you know, I think, I think we've lost this understanding a little bit in our culture. I mean, can you remember a time when you went to the grocery store and there was a little one who fell out screaming and yelling because they walked by a, a package of Pop-Tarts and said, Mama, can I have this? And Mama said no. And then it was on. Fell out in the middle of the aisle screaming and whatever. And the embattled parent just kind of looked around. But what they saw is other wise parents look at them and kind of nod and said, we get it. You're good. This too will pass. Sometimes the Fruit Loops just don't need to happen. But there was a there was a, a kind of a group understanding about that kind of discipline. Today, if we see that, uh, the parent might get turned in for. I don't know, abandonment or something. Maybe that's not the best analogy, but brothers and sisters, God first and foremost is concerned, I want to say it again, not with what we want, but what we need. What we need. And I think it's evident as as he ministered to people like these lepers, or as the translation said today, people with skin problems. Maybe people who experienced terrible pain in their life. Maybe people who, who did not have la- uh, support from their communities and families around them. Whatever. They, we, as disciples, we have to begin to think about the larger view not just the moment as we minister to the world around us, and that there is a difference between those two concerns. The second piece of this puzzle, however, is that Jesus is really trying to ask those around him to think more deeply about what it means to be thankful related to their discipleship. As they are getting ready to receive ultimately the keys of the, to the car of Jesus' ministry here on earth, which is exactly what's getting ready to happen. All these lessons that we've been talking about for the last six or seven Sundays. Jesus is getting ready to turn the car over to them, the disciples. They're going to be running the show. And as they are getting ready to receive those keys, Jesus is... is, is trying to teach some life lessons that will make the difference in their ministry, not just in the moment, but forever. And in this this passage, the other axis of, of the point is, what motivates people to be appreciative? And is it critical as they developed their shared ministry for Christ? I think it's illuminated when Jesus notes in this story that as he sent these folks to the priests of the day, not only did they come away with an unexpected gift, but they came away with a real miracle. A real miracle. Did they understand what they had received? I often, as a pastor, have nightmares sometimes when we do something like we're doing today, which is a church picnic because you know people are involved a lot of different people are volunteering uh i I have nightmares about at the end of the day did we send out all the thank yous because sometimes inadvertently if we miss one somebody's feelings gets hurt so i worry about that did we get all the thank yous out and and, and is that going to be enough Jesus is certainly pointing out at some level, I think, that the joy of serving God is that quite often the one you least expect to say thanks sometimes actually does. That happens. But the reverse is also true. Sometimes the one you expect to say thank you doesn't. And where does that leave us? Jesus highlights the fact that the Samaritan, the one whom would have the least 
possibility of a natural relationship with the people that Jesus was ministering to. It was the Samaritan who was the one who came back and said thanks. So, two possibilities here. I'm trying to move fast because I know we're hungry. I'm sensitive to those kinds of things. Two possibilities. Number one, recognize that the joy of being called and being able to serve God in whatever capacity should be enough. The joy to serve God in whatever capacity should be enough. And then number two, be ready and aware that receiving gratitude from other people is not a guarantee. It doesn't come with the job. You see, it's so easy to become satisfied with what we have and dissatisfied with what we don't. And both of those, both of those ideas lead to a diminished relationship with God. It is a wonderful thing for people, the people of God to be cognizant about the blessings they have in their life and be ready and willing to set the example of, of, of showing gratitude and thanks in everything they do. There's nothing better than to receive that card from a brother or sister when you don't expect it that says, brother, we appreciate you. We're thankful for you. That, uh, there's power in that because it comes from someone's heart. But the, the, we have to be careful because the evil one can, can twist that all around and make it all kinds of ugly stuff because we can start to expect things. And when those expectations are not filled, we get our feelings hurt. And I can't tell you how many times people have got their feelings hurt in the church and sometimes it's hard to get them back. We've got to be tough-skinned, tougher than that, because we serve an audience of one. At the end of the day, that's who we serve. We serve Jesus, and Jesus has come and given us salvation as a free gift. There's nothing we have to do to earn it. It's, it's, it's a gift in our lives, and that is enough. Everybody say, that's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Bless you. We have um, a wonderful church family. There's a lot of gratitude that happens in this church family. And I think that comes from years of Good spiritual teaching, leaders in your church, leaders in your Sunday school classes, over the years, that have, have brought us to this moment together in our church, <laughs> where we have this fantastic opportunity to be a thankful people to continue to find ways to, 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 to lift people up. And there, again, there's nothing better to, to, to say thank you for, for things that people don't really expect. It works. Not as a gimmick to try to get people in, but to show in an authentic way that we really are thankful for that gift of, of Jesus' life and death on the cross. That it really has changed us and formed us and made us. And, and, and when we do things like that, then it really does tamper down our sensitivities to a whole lot of other things. A few years ago, there was a, I forgot the name of the golf tournament, but a, a, a pretty big golf tournament that came around to Charlotte every year. And my boys were small at the time. And we saw a crowd of people coming over one of the... Uh, the holes or the 
I want to say a, a big hill, really. And, and my voice was, you know, is, is that is that one of the, you know, the at the time the the new most popular golfer, you know, trying to get autographs and all that, like a Tiger Woods or somebody like that. And it turned out not to be any of those top 10 or probably even the top 20 golfers at the time. It was something they called Arnie's Army. Arnie's Army. Arnold Palmer, who's in the uh, Hall of Fame at Wake Forest here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He was known as being the one golfer who no matter what he was doing, if he was out on the course, if you got close to him and you wanted to autograph, he'd give it to you. And he gave it to you with a sense of gratitude and thanks. And luckily enough, me and, me and my son were standing there and he walked by and he signed a program for us and it, it felt genuine. And later I, I read a little bit about this, this man and, and why he had such a great appeal late in life to people. And it was exactly that, that he knew the gift that he had been given. And one of the things he would talk to the young golfers about, because they would complain about all the public giving them a hard time, they can't find any place to eat without people coming up to sign their autograph and, and do all these other things. The paparazzi was, you know, just driving them nuts. And he would tell them, if it's driving you nuts, then quit. Get out. Because you have a gift that very few people have. It's been given to you. You can do this and make a living, and if you don't like it, then fine, you can quit. But if you do, when you walk out of this clubhouse, show your appreciation. Show your gratitude. And I believe it's that kind of attitude that helps move us forward as a, as a life community. Being thankful, even when circumstances may suggest that we have nothing to be thankful about. And here's the really interesting part of all this. Sometimes we have to get knocked down so far. Right? Sometimes we have to get knocked down so far by life to that we get to the edge of that precipice before we recognize how much we really have. It's at that moment when, when things don't look good and haven't looked good for a long time that somehow God can speak to us, right? In the midst of our trouble, somehow it's in that moment that we can actually hear the voice of God. And I want to tell you that when we hear that voice and if we would dare, if we would dare act on it, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that God can't do with this church and this group of people that are gathered right here today. Nothing. I don't know what it is. We have to figure that out. But there's nothing that can stop us if we act on that grace and mercy in which has been given to us. I named the title of the ser sermon, Mercy Means the Most. It does in the sense of getting a repeat, reprieve in life. However, gratitude is the natural first cousin of mercy. <laughs> it follows what we have received. So today, here's my preface. For all of us that are going to go down to the picnic here in just a little bit and enjoy a wonderful meal that's been provided and all the fellowship that goes along. You know, I wanted to do uh, one-legged sacked races and I wanted to do carrying the eggs on the spoons race. I mean, I had all kinds of things I wanted to do, but then the lawyer told me a liability wouldn't let us do it. <laughs> I said, oh, we're, we're, nobody's going to sue anybody around here. But we have an opportunity to renew God's gratitude in our own lives with each other. We go down here and have a great time and celebrate what, the God, what God has done. It's that simple. 
celebrate what God has done. Amen? Are you hungry? You ready to go? Okay. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are thankful. We're thankful that you have brought us to this place. We're thankful that we are your sons and daughters. We are thank you, thankful for all the things that we call out for, even though sometimes, Lord, we don't really understand what we need. We know that you do. So, Lord, bless us and keep us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our final hymn this morning is We Are Called to Be God's People, page 635. Let us stand and sing. May the God of power and grace and gratitude surround us. May his son Jesus reflect through us his love and mercy for all people. And may the spirit of almighty God guide us and keep us in all that we say and all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.